today, Kentronic Labs, located in Northeast Tennessee, is our proud uh, sponsor to uh, bring us uh, the day. Uh, they've been serving the broadcast industry with top quality products and services since 1949, when Louis A. King founded the company. And they are, they want, like to be thought of as the antenna system supplier that provides a maximally flat load impedance to complement the modern vintage AM transmitters for analog or digital, whether Xperia HD or the DRM modulation. In the backbone of the value that Kentronic Labs provides to the AM broadcast station owner is their in-house developed CKT net in a RayPat design software that enable their engineering team to design the complex multi-frequency, multi-tower shared antenna systems that are particularly suited for the case where, well, owners sell a transmitter property and decide to multiplex on another existing station. Kentronic Labs also provides an array of FM products, combiners, coax switches, LPFM weatherproof racks, dummy loads, and uh, 50 to 50, 5 to 50 kilowatts. So from concept to on air, Kentronic Labs has the products and services that you need. Check them out at www.kentronic.com. And so we thank Tom King and his bunch. Now, today's topic, as you have noticed, uh, is what is a broadcast engineer? And back in the old days, good grief, uh, you see pictures of broadcast engineers in gathering, in groups. There were 63 of them at WLW, and they all had suits on and uh, ties. Uh, we got into the 40s and 50s, and combo operation became very common. Pocket protection. I did look for my pocket protector, and I'm sorry, I couldn't find it. I've got it. It'll probably slap me in the face in an hour or two, but uh, I don't see anybody else with pocket protectors here. But go reach for yours. Uh, in the uh, middle 60s, I got my first ticket and drifted from uh, announcing into my first real engineering job. The program director called me up and said, change the tubes in the transmitter at 3 a.m. First time I ever did that. In 1970, I got my first union job in LA and learned how unions work or don't, as the case may be. In the uh, late 70s, I went to the NAB directional antenna seminars in Cleveland uh, that uh, were put on. And I learned that no, 63 staff members was not really new anymore. Uh, one guy says, well, we have three engineers at our station. And the other guy says, well, I have five working here. And they turned to me and I said, well, I work five stations, beginning of contract engineering, taking the, uh, the load here. State boards uh, around that time, I think, started to try to kill the title engineer for us in radio. Is something for us to uh, talk about. And the question rises, how did you get started in broadcasting? What did you think an engineer was all about? I thought it was very interesting. Clay Freinwald uh, did an article for the SBE chapter in Seattle uh, one year talking about the ads in the old uh, engineering magazines, the ham magazines and wireless magazines, things like that. The great, uh, great career as an engineer and they said the, 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 the salary. In 1980, a lot of people were still working for the same money in smaller markets, especially. And so what are the things that an engineer should be doing? What are the things an engineer should not be doing? And that's what we want to talk about. And uh, everyone is invited to share with us. Uh, I'm going to put this up. It's one of several uh, narratives that have come to me over the years. I think here, uh, you have to laugh, don't you? Uh, the broadcast engineer are expected to possess the following skills and perform these duties. Data processing systems management, purchasing and operation of telephone and office systems, 
complete understanding of thermostats, their use, the ability to create good anal analog analogies so non-techs could understand them, able to lift heavy objects, especially fireproof file cabinets, safes, cases of promotional prizes, boxes of computer paper, must have knowledge of computer programming, drafting, building codes, landscape maintenance, pneumatics, hydraulics, accounting, and general office procedures, meteorology and graphics design, well, you can see how old this one is, Novell 3X and 4X, Windows Server, Windows 2000, Windows XP knowledge. Secondary skills and tasks include woodworking and carpentry, metalworking and fabrication, audio-visual equipment setup and repair, including overhead projectors, screens, LCD computer panels, machine tool setup and operation, uh, printed circuit board layout, fabrication repair, firefighting, microwave theory and practice, acoustic design and construction. Hey, Gordon, we hear you. Ability to develop and execute promotional events on short notice, spot and promotion production techniques, television and telephone repair, lawn care, experience in two-way communications theory and practice, diesel generator set knowledge, board operator, air talent, multi-track live mix down, knowledge of building construction, electrical codes, OSHA regulations, fire codes, automatic uh, automotive electrical system repair, analog, digital, microprocessor, processor design and repair, get gas station attendant, shoe repair, dishwasher detergent acquisition, photocopy analysis, clock and watch. I haven't read this in a while. First aid, including minor, minor surgical experience, office furniture purchasing, repair and moving, image scanning and touch up, coat hook server, a fax server, HTML programming, database maintenance, knowledge of a me pro. Wow, that is old. Approach freelance graphics, Microsoft Office, Word, Access, Excel, front page, Lotus 123, Marketron, First Rate, Fox Pro, Arbitron Maximizer, and Strata, CBSI, Enco, Audio Vault, Exchange, Netscape, Satellite Downlink, no, Internet Explorer, PK Zip, Alpha Junior, Adobe Photoshop, Digital Camera Operation. How many of those are still around? Satellite downlink installation, operation repair, photography, videography, video editing, including camera repair, may be called upon for news and traffic reporting, production, other cross training, pest control, voiceover talent, plumbing and flood control, counseling, scouting, budgeting, financial experience, insulation, operation, maintenance of kitchen appliances, invisible air conditioning, uh, invisible fence repair and installation. Garage opener maintenance, uh, repair installation, air conditioning technician, personal computer repair, sink strainer repair, city map repair, fountain pen repair, piano repair, coffee pot technician, appliance purchase, decision maker, staff policing, experience requires a food service technician, we're almost finished, electronic keychain repair, engineer repairing, revolving emergency lights, Palm pilot repair, oh my goodness, bird removal, removing gum from keys, banking, monetary exchange, manufacturer, rest, chauffeur, map maker, furniture construction, trash collection, removal, build, building and grounds maintenance, concrete technician, you must be able to work evenings, weekends and holidays, expect to wear a pager and or cell phone everywhere all the time, 24 seven, you must be able to work 24 hours a day and Oh, the ability to install, operate, and maintain broadcast equipment might be helpful. All right, I'm done. Let's hear what you have to say. When they told you to uh, change the tubes and the transmitter, did they turn it off first? I was allowed to turn it off, yes. Yeah. Oddly enough, they want to get back into the control room after I had uh, tuned it up and uh, found the dip and uh, got the loading and the tuning just right. The uh, local cop was standing in the control room and this is up in Phoenix and he uh, uh, was there and I said, yes, sir, what can I do for you? He says, oh, I was just checking. I heard you go off the air. I thought maybe the locals got to you. <laughs> the most important Very question. 
to any engineer, how many people have been working on a transmitter when you're off and the manager is standing right behind you saying, how, how much longer? <laughs> yeah. or, or the salespeople yeah. constantly calling you. How soon are you going to be back on? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Barry, Richard. Um, Hi. I, th I think that, uh, you know, it's wonderful to read a list of, uh, of all the things that many of us have been, been exposed to do or are supposed to do or required to do or wanted to do. But it doesn't go to the mission. It doesn't go to the mission statement. It doesn't go to the goals. Exactly. And, uh, and uh, uh, I think that over time, those of us that have stuck with it, uh, first of all, uh, a broadcast engineer was somebody who believes in the technology and believes in, in the medium. And uh, if, you, if you don't do that, it's, it's just a job. And uh, it's uh, it's like uh, you know looking looking for a companion. Uh, the companion has to be interesting enough to uh, for you to fall in love with. And uh, uh, if uh, because a lot of us could probably say with some honesty that uh, if we hadn't fallen in love with this medium, we would have divorced it a long time ago. Uh, so. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the original broadcast engineers were uh, were inventors, pioneers, uh, and uh, people who made a lot of mistakes to finally get us to where we are now. Uh, and I still think there, in some of us, there's still some of that spirit. Uh, you don't learn by doing nothing. You do learn through your mistakes. And by sharing the experience of your mistakes and your successes, uh, we become uh, a group of, of colleagues. So uh, not, not wanting to ramble on forever because I probably could about this. Uh, uh, many of us learned uh, how to evolve uh, uh, when uh, the transmitter engineers went away and, and many transmitter engineers were brought to the studio and some of them didn't like it uh, because as I've said to many people here over time, uh, many of us in this profession originally were more comfortable with things than with people. And I think that the essential skill that you have to have these days to be a survivor in this particular line of work is to have made the transition to uh, know the value of your team and your colleagues and uh, and and what what is being accomplished and uh, without them you are you're just uh, uh, you're pushing on the wrong side of the rock. Uh, I think I've said enough. Well, you make some very good points, Richard. And uh, uh, what we do want to focus on is is who we are, what we are, and you did use one word that is almost out of date now, and that's team. Um, too many of us, uh, at least the folks that I see here on the screens, uh, we're one of a kind. We're all by ourselves. The word chief engineer is almost in of itself a uh, oxymoron, isn't it? I want to add the announcement. Once you're off the air, make an announcement about it. Oh, yes. Thank you, WKRP. Yeah, I recall the GM saying one time when we were off the air, the television station, well, can't we put a slate up on the screen and let everybody know that we're off the air? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I recall the we'll GM get to that. one time when we were off the air, the television station, well, can't we put a slate up on the screen and let everybody know that we're off the air? One of the, yeah, I the things that, that when we were off the air, the television station, well, can we put a slate up on the screen and let everybody know that we're off the air? One of one the, of the things that, um, that the industry has really forgotten is that engineering is a profession, and we have to be professional. And unfortunately, if everybody in a station 
treat us like the bottom of the barrel uh, and says, oh, you have to do everything, including the janitorial and stuff. And we accept it. That, that degrades the, the whole industry of the broadcast engineer. Remember, we, we were uh, of the last of the bunch of the employees that actually had to be licensed by the government to uh, work at the station and so forth. And we also have our training. And it, we have to value it and let the company that we're working for know that they have to value our experience and our skills. And th then you will have a better experience as an engineer. This is a bigger and I'll, I'll go disconnect. along with... Yeah. Uh, Gordon? Yeah. Backing up what David said, um, a pet peeve of mine has always been contract engineers that undercut the market where Ooh. the um, let, let's say for instance and I'll just pick numbers out of thin air going rate is 50 bucks an hour they're charging 25 and if you're uh, doing it at at the 50, it makes it awfully hard in some places to um, to get a foot in the door. This raises. On the two, other hand, this raises two issues. Well, there, I won't tell you how many times I followed someone who worked like that, and the first thing I had to do was clean up the mess. I've been in some stations three times that way to clean up the mess when a GM or an owner decided he could uh, enjoy half the price for the engineering. We have to decide what we are worth and you cannot become a loss leader or you cannot become a discount engineer and remain respected and remain wanted uh, except by the cheap guys. And the other thing is, if you're going to work the contract route, and they're and they have the uh, uh, whoever from the station monitoring how many minutes you're there, you can't do the right job. You have to do the fast job, and that's wrong because I I know when I'm doing work, I want to put do my best and be proud of the work I'm done, and make sure it looks right as well as uh, operates right. And sometimes looking right takes a little longer, and you know they a lot of people don't respect that anymore. Well, probably what you have to do is to stick to major markets. Uh, my engineering staff at WOR uh, in the early days was incredible. And uh, at XTRA, we had some of the most wonderful Mexican engineers. You could go down to the transmitter site in Rosarito and pretty much eat off the floor. And those guys wore white lab coats. And in Boston, basically the uh, same thing. No contract engineers, all full-time people. Yes. Rich, you, you had some of the best engineers at WOR and I'm friends with a lot of them. And a lot of them have, are gone now, but they, that was the best engineering staff I've ever seen. But now take this back to what Richard was saying. As professionals, if you're going to work one station and you have multiple engineers, or even if you're just one person at one station, what about the clusters where we have five, six, seven, eight stations? Maybe there's two people. Can you do a good job? Can you truly do the maintenance? What is an engineer for? To shuffle paperwork? Put fires out? Anybody have experience here in an owner manager who recognizes that the engineering department has to do more than just show up and sit and read the paper? Well, Barry, you're also looking at the other battle that most engineers are fighting nowadays in the larger companies where IT thinks that they can run anything with a wire. We'll get there. We'll get there. Mark? Well, as, as an engineer for a group that has uh, a number of stations across the state of Nebraska, 
and I am the only guy. Um, fortunately, I do have uh, the hierarchy here does understand the value of the engineer and it gives me quite a bit of latitude uh, to take care of things. Um, you know, I brought up the other day the fact that the, the price of gas has gone up so high that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe my maintenance uh, outings are going to be uh, fewer. And he said, don't worry about the gas. He said, I, I just soon the equipment be maintained and, and kept in operation. And, and, uh, and of course, he's constantly telling me, don't drive yourself in the ground. Slow down a little bit. Um, you know, take care of a job. And if, you know, you're tired by the end of the day and you're not home yet, you get a motel somewhere. Um, but then yeah. I've worked on the other side of the fence where you had people that wanted it done yesterday and they wanted to hurry up and do it. And, you know, like David, I'm, I'm not one that rushes through things. I, I want to make sure that it's done right so I don't have to come back. <laughs> Good point. Good point. I've worked for I've worked for owners that that well I was out at one transmitter one night working the uh, GM shows up with boxes of pizza and other things to drink I've worked at a place where uh, when I bought my first uh, VCR the next day there was this box of cassette tapes on my desk and then I've worked for station owners and GMs that you have to justify every 25 cents you spend I didn't. I, work, I worked for. A, no. I worked for a manager that actually called me in to do work for him, and he put a stopwatch next to me. I walked out. Well, <laughs> there you are. I've done that too. Uh, you have to again if we're professionals. So let's let's start at the top here before we uh, come back to IT. What is a radio engineer? What the, the let's list one or two or five things that we are. How do you feel about that out there? Hey, Barry, Bert here. Hi, Bert. You have to, I'm sorry I got here late, but I was out on a false alarm. Um, I think you have to differentiate between a radio station engineer and a radio engineer, someone that, you know, you have to kind of differentiate between the transmitter and, uh, you know, someone who takes care of studio stuff. And it's, I know it's so diffused that it's hard to do that, but I think uh, uh, there has to be some kind of a, a demark point to, because it's so confusing. I agree with uh, Bert because you, you're, and your first mistake, Barry, is saying radio engineer because nowadays radio stations are handling video, we're handling streaming web and so forth. Um, and you're, ha so you're you're a broadcast engineer and you're a media content distributor and that's what your engineering is all right uh, yes I, I will agree I, I should not have used the word radio broadcast is and that's what I said in my little blurb the other day what is a broadcast engineer media uh, media engineers <laughs> all right all right is now now we have always traditionally had the emphasis on the RF uh, perhaps, or AF, if you're a studio engineer, now the IT comes into play. And we have a balancing in some places where you find a station where the RF guy is uh, trying to do the IT. And then there are places where you're trying to train the IT guy by pointing out that there's life above five volts. So how much should we know how much should, as an industry, should our organizations be teaching owners and teaching managers what an engineer is worth rather than how few we can get away with? I think, well, you have, I'm sorry. sorry, go ahead, Dave. You have to also decide on the hierarchy. I remember in the last days of CBS, uh, we had a battle where a new uh, person that was in charge of IT suddenly said, oh, uh, the broadcast engineers are under us. And, uh, and he, he got chased out because, because of that. And uh, 
you have to know the hierarchy of how you're working because if the IT people are in charge of you, you have to make sure they understand what's going on. And making people understand is the hardest job you'll ever have. Along with what Dave is saying, people do not do not seem to understand that we are in show business. We're in the technical side of show business. We're, we're you know, we're not scientists uh, inventing things, although we are, but that is, that's not our primary goal. Our primary goal is not to invent and not to create. Our primary goal is to make, you know, to keep the station on the air and to solve problems. And yes, we invent things because we come up with ways to resolve problems but you know we're not in a it's not like we're in a think tank where we have to come up with stuff our job is to keep the show on the air um, and i want to make a comment um you mentioned barry about station owners you know having it learn engineering um well, that can get downright dangerous if you send an IT guy out to the transmitter site that has never dealt with high voltage before. And there are some of them, you know, some management and such, they don't understand that you just can't do that. Um, but I recall a, a friend of mine telling me that he was at NEB one year and he was sitting next to these two guys and he said, well, what, um, you know, what station are you with and, and what do you do there? Well, we're with I do, we're, we're in IT at whatever station they were at. And um, he, uh, he asked him, he said, well, what kind of transmitter do you have out at your site? Uh, we couldn't tell you that, uh, we've never been out there. And he said, well, don't you guys take, our, uh, do you have an engineer that takes care of that? And he said, no, we're supposed to, but we keep praying that we don't have to go out there because we don't know anything about it. In the uh, early 70s, I was doing some work for a new owner of uh, KFRE in, in Fresno, and they were inspected by the FCC and asked uh, about transmitter readings and so on. And the owner said, what transmitter? Had no idea. The transmitter was still being run by the TV station they had split from, but uh, he didn't know there was a transmitter. This, this stuff just magically appears. Kevin Kidd told us a story some months back about station uh, that he was called in uh, to do a, uh, a survey of by the new owner and he asked the owner where the transmitter was and of course the trans owner said what transmitter and kevin said well how do you get this thing to the listener well i just play the music and news and they finally found out that it was on a farm somewhere near the uh, station city and because the owner of that farm had died and the son didn't know who to contact, the transfer was sitting in the field with a tarp over it. Tarp over it, still operating? Yep. Must have been a very cold location. Yeah, that's amazing. I've heard stories of everything. Well, down in Mexico, there was one uh, engineer here that went down to work on a station and discovered the tower was leaned against the transmitter building. Well, don't feel too bad. I put uh, my format, the BXTRA format, on XEVIP in Mexico City. And I'm looking and I see a switch on the wall with zip cord was the tower light. Yeah. So what, they have a calendar and everybody had their scheduled uh, time that they had to go turn the light switch on to turn the tower lights on? <laughs> uh, apparently, it was all manual. <laughs> Plug it in uh, now. Top the uh, Maria Isabel uh, Hotel in the Zona Rosa. I think one thing we have to realize is that the, the technology and the state of the art is changing or has changed. Um, 
transmitters simply do not require the intense attention that they once did. True. And that kind of makes, shall we say, the transmitter only guy a bit of an anachronism. And um, uh, the only way, if, if all you want to do is work on transmitters, you better have an awful lot of clients or a, a big group that you're working for and be ready to put on a lot of miles because um, there just isn't, isn't the work. You don't have to, with a, with a modern transmitter, you, uh, yes, there are things you have to do with it. You still have to clean the air filters and um, occasionally make sure all the connections are tight that count. But you don't have to do that every day. Or for that matter, maybe not even every week. Well, we have a number of folks that don't get to a transverse site every month, which... That's correct. You know, and um, uh, I, many, many years ago, I wrote an article in uh, Radio Guide uh, back when you were connected with that, Barry. Um, and uh, it was a bit of a cry to broadcast engineers. Don't get too stuck in the mud or you're going to be a fossil. Mm -hmm. I didn't say it in those words, but, um, and I actually used an example of a city in Illinois uh, that said many years ago said, oh, well, we have, we have this river that feeds right into the Mississippi. We don't care if the train doesn't come here. So the train went someplace else. The town pretty much died shortly thereafter. And uh, the only reason it's surviving now is because back in the 70s, some people said, hey, there's some cool buildings here and basically turned the whole place into a tourist trap. As we, as we think about this, uh, I see, Dennis, you've unmuted yourself. Did you have something you wanted to say before we moved on? Actually, I did. Um, I wanted to touch on what Gordon said and also what we talked about earlier being media. How much longer is it going to be before we even have transmitters anymore? Because broadcasting and media, it's about the content, not necessarily the transport medium. With internet and with the FCC coming in and trying to take our frequencies away from us, the days of transmitters and transmitter engineers may all be uh, coming to an end anyway. Very good point. And yes, there are a number of people that think as near as five or 10 years that everything is going to be on uh, streaming of one way or another. Well, that's going to be okay until you get a great big disaster that comes along and people aren't going to be able to get any information because it's all, it's all in the wires and the wires are all broken. Yes. Or need electricity to work. We that's know cool. that, but how do we convince other people of that fact? It's, it's funny. They're, they're, they're going to learn the hard way. They always it, do. It's funny. We were just talking about that this morning, our operations manager and our GM and I were talking about, well, what happens when the internet does fail? Um, there's a story on, on the, in Forbes about cyber pandemic survival guide is the headline. Um, they think there's going to be some serious cyber issues and the internet will go down. Well, how do we feed our stations then? Oh, well, we don't. Uh, we, could do, we could do a couple of hours here sometime about <laughs> EAS in the internet. But so let's not go there today. But, you know, that just brings up one of the many problems that we're looking at that uh, moving forward. Uh, with the technology and people who are in charge, who are making technology policy, who don't understand the technology. And don't want you to should, understand. Uh, <laughs> you should come to my market. 
Uh, we had a tornado come through uh, three or four years ago. The only reliable source of information was local TV because they had radar uh, and uh, two meter ham radio. Uh, I scanned the dial while this was happening. Radio had nothing until it was over. And then the talk stations came in and you know it was after the fact. How did you feel after your house blew away? So I've got, you know, I'm in a, the vastest of wastelands for uh, radio. You know, they may as well not have transmitters at all. We have uh, 40 some folks uh, between uh, the Zoom and the YouTube uh, connection right now so what are what is your view of the organizations that support broadcast techs for lack of a better word to take engineering and IT together and what are some of the things that we should not do can we draw a line in the sand and say no I am not going to plunge the toilet Mark, <laughs> so you put that. No, in. I'm not going to plunge a toilet because I'm four hours away at a transmitter site. You'll have to call somebody. And I got this picture on my email that just scared me to death. I don't know how that came about. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, you know, we mentioned technology and, and uh, state of the art. And our GM here really likes to brag about the fact that his engineer can basically run everything off his cell phone. And uh, for the most part, I can get into everything off my cell phone. And we do have the technology where we are able to just simply power cycle equipment out of the transmitter site uh, hours away and save the drive out there uh, to do that very thing. Um, I think some uh, some companies and GMs and such probably get also get the mindset that, well, gosh, if that if the engineer can do that, then why do we need them? Well, somebody still has to go out and change those air filters and service the generator. I was out yesterday on a generator service um, issue, and you know that's sometimes that's kind of scary. Uh, fortunately, I'm working for a group that they don't think that way and realize that there still has to be boots on the ground, regardless as to what kind of technology we have. The engineer is important because he, he's the guy that knows which button to push first. We had a, this is a little bit what we were doing, talking about earlier, but we had an IT department that was getting aggressive that they wanted to control everything including all of our production networks, uh, all the on-air stuff. And we just simply said, because these guys are used to, you know, rebooting a server in the middle of the day, you know, you know, if the server goes down for two minutes while it's rebooting or whatever, then, you know, most people don't notice it as a, as a user. Um, but if you drop, you know, two, two minutes of airtime, you know, you notice that. And so we just pointed out, you know, we're billing $10,000 a minute for airtime. You want to be responsible for that amount of loss to the company if the network goes down? And they backed off. They didn't want the responsibility. We get the responsibility. For them than me. I think uh, one of the things we need to be careful that we shouldn't do is be too protective. Um, there's, um, I've, I've seen, I won't even begin to guess how many uh, really good broadcast engineers that start talking about IT people like they're the enemy. And they can be your best friends. Um, yeah, you have to educate them. Let them know okay, these things have to be able to get uh, get through. And yeah, there's uh, 
there's all kinds of things that we can cooperate on. Chances are the IT people know network security a hundred times better than you do, if they're any good. And um, they're, uh, you know, they they can be very useful. But on the other hand, they do have to uh, be educated. Uh, I think uh, the place I'm working now, even though I'm only part time, they they have a, a really good situation that yes, there is a campus IT department and they take care of all the security issues, all the, all the um, uh, oh, all, all, pretty much all the networking. But what I hear over and over again is that the radio station can't access their own website. They need to have a Comrex uh, a port open to get audio from a studio to a transmitter. And the first thing the IT people say is, no, you're not going to breach our firewall. Well, and the the correct answer is, first of all, you have to have someone that speaks the IT department's language. No, you have to have a manager that stands up for the tech side. Well, that's, that's but, where it is. But it's it's not an adversarial it should not be an adversarial relationship but it is but it is I but mean, it shouldn't be that's what i'm saying wait, just, just just a moment gordon you're saying that the the engineering should know how to speak to the it department <clears throat> but shouldn't the it people also know and understand what engineering needs I mean, I'm I'm talking about That's engineering. That's what I said. I, we have to educate them. Okay, I'm I'm talking like IT and engineering are two different worlds. They're different areas, but they're both they're, engineering. They're they different faces of the same card. They have to communicate with each I'm other. Right, this is George. Uh, I manage both the IT team and the "quote unquote" traditional radio engineering team, and they are a team. And they have to work together; otherwise, they're not going to be working here very long. Yeah, the what, the dis, the situation that I was starting to describe: we have campus IT, but we also have in radio a team of IT people that understand intimately the things like the Axia system. Uh, our Zeta system, all the stuff that we need for um, for the Comrex, for the Telos, all of this stuff. And the leader of that team works under our director of engineering, but he used to be part of the campus IT department. So they know him, they respect him, they can talk back and forth very well. And we have a great relationship there. They provide us what we need, and they're not over, not trying to take over our stuff. I worked well, for I, a, I worked as a standby for one of the major group owners. The, uh, in fact, what happened was the engineer moved to another city, and I was temporary for only thirteen months. But because I was temporary, I couldn't have an email account. I couldn't have access from the outside to the automation system or the transmitter systems or anything, really. If I wanted to get anything done, I had to drive down there or find the IT gal and ask her to do something. The, the silos in so many of these companies got so bad that one, one time I was trying to arrange a lunch meeting with a fellow engineer here in town. And I sent him emails over and over and over. Finally, I picked the phone up and I said, how come you didn't answer me? And he says, I didn't get a single one of your emails. And we looked into it. The IT department had instituted a whitelisting uh, policy so that only people whose addresses were on the whitelist could get through. And uh, I raised the question. I said, suppose you had an ad agency that wanted to bring you $50,000 and they're not on your whitelist. That got to the GM 
and the white list ended the next day. But you had to find out the hard way because the IT people are in a different world. But well, they don't I, have to be. They That's don't have point. to be. We, we need, as, as engineers, we're kind of trying to bridge all of these worlds. Our, one of the things we need to do is start breaking down these silos. Good. George, tell us how you did it. Who's George? Mr. Molnar. George Molnar. Oh, oh. Sorry, I did the right button. Uh, how I did it? I didn't do it. Uh, I just have a bunch of really good people who understand getting together, and uh, we share. We meet every week. We talk in the hallway, and uh, the thing I said when I first got here is, like, we don't have an IT department, and it's it was disruptive. I said, we have a broadcast engineering department, and everybody in it is a broadcast engineer, and that's that. And we did RF safety training for everyone, including the quote unquote IT people. Um, each of the IT people are going to the transmitters uh, from time to time where they talk about control. Uh, and our transmitters, I mean, let's be real, uh, our STLs are digital, our control systems are on the internet or on a closed LAN. Um, we have all kinds of stuff that overlaps. So it's, it's not a hard sell, it just needs to be vocalized. I was the uh, first IT person at WOR, mostly because we're the only one there who knew computers. I set up the streaming, set up the local network, uh, and all that stuff until uh, Tom Ray came in, and uh, we completely changed our phone system, and he took took everything over. Did a terrific job of it. Tom was quite an engineer. And yes. I love what uh, somebody said earlier about, you know, how many dollars per minute uh, is being off the air worth. You know, it's, it's not a small number. And I think everybody gets that. Yeah. Hey, so, Barry. Richard. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to say one, one thing. The IT uh, professional industry is rather young. And I think they suffer from something I talked about earlier is that uh, most of them are uh, to paraphrase what I said before for the IT, they're much more comfortable with ones and zeros than they are with people. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, some of them have learned that lesson. Some of them have learned to, to work with people. Some of them haven't yet. The other thing I want to observation in general is I, we haven't heard a peep from Mary or Elaine or Adrian on this uh, subject right now. And uh, I think we're ignoring uh, uh, people who have a great deal of uh, to offer us here as far as uh, uh, comments and experience. So Barry, could you try to evoke some comments that way? Good point. Elaine uh, did send a, a little uh, note here into the chat about her start up at KSL. <laughs> there. Yeah, I, I think the uh, Here's my uh, my problem right now. My uh, my start in the industry was not in engineering, but I dealt with engineering on a daily basis. I mean, so much so that I ended up marrying one of the engineers at KSL, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> but uh, we depended on those guys for everything. And I think that's part of the problem that has evolved over the years with general managers is that they view all of you as people who can do anything. And to them, both engineering and IT are just these technical things. And why in the world wouldn't you know everything about it? And so it, it really is a matter of educating the management on, on what they need to expect from, from you guys. Because I, I know how busy you are. You're, you're constantly running ragged and... Uh, they uh, they need to be informed and aware of this so that they can you know, have a better appreciation. Excellent point. Yeah. Well, thank your uh, your GM at uh, KSL years ago in the early days of AM Stereo. A friend and I started the AM Stereo Association, and the only member that signed up was KSL. 
So thank them for me. Hey, Barry. Yes, David. When I, when I was uh, working at CBS and we were designing uh, the TELUS R2 and planning the deployment, um, I said flat out that we need IT on our side because obviously we're dealing with a lot of firewalls and everything because of the streaming. So what I did basically was write a definitive script. If someone needed a, uh, a port open or so forth, they fit in the number and they actually read the sheet and then sent the, they called and sent an email with the, uh, the actual uh, form uh, on there. So it was in the understanding that the IT people actually helped me write that script. So that way they were able to understand. And that's how I got around uh, the problems of IT when, uh, when deploying uh, uh, 250 uh, encoders that time. Mm -hmm. Now, th there was also one really big disaster. Before I was at CBS, I was, I was putting in one of the first Axios systems in uh, New Jersey. And I put in a beautiful system. And one day I walk in and they say, hey, we're down. I walk in there and the IT person had pulled out every single CAD5 cable. And I, I said, what are you doing? He goes, this isn't in my network. I don't know what it is. I'm getting rid of it. I said, you just took the whole station off the air. <laughs> so, so, we, uh, so we have the first, the first thing is education. You have to educate. And that totally education... you have to educate and you have to have them in in the loop the whole time and if if you think there's going to be any misunderstanding have them help you write the script this way there is a perfect understanding well that education but you need to bring them in from the the first moment they join the group to yes. join the staff Absolutely. So you have to have the understanding from the and management and then we get to where george has a department that is unified instead of being two separate groups that don't often talk to each other and each protective of their own kingdom. And worse, the IT people don't work on weekends and at night. Um, you know, here, here at Spirit, we have an outside IT group that does maintain our, our main network infrastructure. And I'm talking about the office and server stuff here. Um, I maintain what we do as far as streaming on the IT side, but uh, the, the head of their IT group and I are very close and we do communicate with, with things. Now, the other day, there was a little, little bit of a issue with all of a sudden a program that was syncing time on our automation computers was gone and I approached them with that. And we kind of both kind of figured that maybe at some point during an update, thank you, Microsoft, um, that the program was removed. And so I had to reinstall the program. So our, our time is back where it should be. Um, but yet I, you know, I informed him, I said, this, this has to be on there. You know, we, we've got to be able to keep our time synced up correctly so that uh, with the network so that uh, everything works and it does take a lot of education and when our IT group first came on board here four years ago um, we did get with them and we actually physically gave them a tour of the plant here and pointed out this is this is what this is and so on and so forth. In fact, we had just switched over to AOIP with Axia and that was something I had pointed out too in, in reference to David's story that, uh, you know, these switches here are, are off limits to to you guys because that's the Axia network and it has to be. So, yeah, education is very important. Well, like Gordon says, there's got to be a, a, a way to solidly pull people together so that you're really all on the same team and that you really communicate. If you're going to do something, you let the other one know because, you know, we're so interwoven now between if you will, RF and, you know, transmission and 
uh, IT, I, I like to use the term transmission because there's so many facets of transmission. But you, you know, you really got to pull together. And there's, in a, in a lot of cases, I would say it's a lack of understanding of what the other person is doing. But I've also seen situations where one side figures they are more important than the other side, like you were talking about earlier, that uh, IT came along and they're not going to give you the, the port or give you the access to the computer that you need to either get a program in as a remote or to, to interface something to the transmitter control system or what. And, and this is really where a lot of problems happen. You've, you've got to pull these two groups together to be one group that works together. That's exactly true. And uh, what George was saying, because I've seen too many and I read too many uh, posts from people, especially in the university community or the Native American community and, and others, where just to load a program uh, or an app into their computer requires a whole huge major extravaganza of forms and time and just to get permission uh, to, to get past the computer that says, if you're not an administrator, you can't load this. I really do think that, 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 that uh, I did. Did, when I was running the Talk America radio network, uh, I had, speaking of Palm Pilots, <laughs> I had one and I wanted to uh, connect it to my computer. I had to jump through all kinds of hoops because, of course, IDT, I don't know if they're doing it now, but they, they ran long distance and we had a major computer center and uh, they were the most important thing, you know, in the universe. Now, I'll be, I'll be absolutely clear about this today. Security is a major concern. Look, look how many intercom, uh, Look at the other major groups that got taken. Uh, Urban One, Sinclair, Sinclair. They're still they're still having problems. Yeah, because of ransomware, malware, and yeah, there are. Good grief! I worked a station where the weekender, the weekender went in and and changed the password on the entire automation system and shut it down. So it does seem to make sense to let the IT people uh, do software installations uh, because of these security issues. Um, there's also concerns about uh, bring your own device and, and people putting their own devices on, on the network and screwing things up that way. So it well, is, Harold, it is so tricky. Many things have got, have got, I, you know, internet access, you know, even, uh, even things that you would consider that would fall into the domain of the engineer. Yeah, and I, I do think though that uh, if the IT people are responsible for uh, security, then you know they they should take that uh, responsibility. But they do need to actually let their customers, which is the um, broadcast transmitter engineer or whatever, um, you know, they should serve that that customer. And I, I uh, most recently was designing equipment for uh, movie theaters, which is all digital now. And, uh, you know, our equipment would go onto their internal network. And we had to deal with access to outside world for FTP or for um, NTP and stuff like that. So security is a big deal. Well, the IDT security, uh, they were an ISP. They used to own Genie. Uh, so, you know, the security was just iron fisted as it really should have been, but it's, uh, you know, I would never think of putting a, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, little doohickey into the, uh, into the computer and introducing, uh, any malware, which I think even in the, um, uh, the case where the 
Iranian, um, what are they? Their thingy, centrifuge issue. Around. <laughs> Somebody actually introduced the uh, that spyware, uh, a malware, into the system with a uh, with a doohickey. So it USB is. drives. A lot. I think a lot of places just have the uh, front panel uh, USB ports uh, disabled or uh, plugged up. I, it occurred to me the other day the simple fix for a lot of these problems is for everybody just to roll back their their networking protocol to NetBuoy. You know, <clears throat> excuse me, I think along the lines of what uh, George is fortunate enough that they can roll everything under one department, but even if you're in an organization where the IT and the RF are two separate departments, it needs to be an ongoing relationship, not just something where it's like, oh, you only come to see me when you need something. I mean, it, it can go beyond that. Uh, that's, that's one thing that I found has worked real well at some of the places I've been at is where you, you still, you know, communicate on a regular basis. Hey, do you want to go out and see the transmitter? It's amazing how many people do want to go out and see the transmitter and understand some of it. Um, but even if you're in two separate departments, get together, have lunch, uh, you know, whatever. Just don't. I, I know how I feel when it's kind of like you have somebody that it's like you only come to see me when you need something, but the rest of the time you won't even give me half a smile in the hallway. So uh, keep it, even if you're even if you're not one, you're still working for the same people. Well, at uh, WOR, Rick Buckley uh, insisted that all of us go out to the transmitter site in uh, New Jersey. I rented a bus. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to go because I, you know, I'd seen transmitters. But uh, he insisted that everybody hop on that bus and go out and see, you know, how it all worked. And um, Tom Ray had just, uh, I think he had just installed a new uh, Harris. And that I hadn't seen. But we all slept out there. And uh, that's the older site, not the, the most recent one. I was doing some work for uh, Radio Kansas and they uh, took their whole staff out to a couple of transmitter sites in a bus and I went along on that ride. I, I think um, sometimes we can be our own worst enemies. Um, I think it was Richard a while back mentioned that some so many of these IT people are much more comfortable with ones and zeros than they are with people. Well, that probably covers most of us, only it's with electronics uh, rather than people. And uh, something I learned a long time ago is that you have to learn to communicate with people in order to survive. And um, that's, that's not something that came naturally to me. I was an introvert. I still am to a, to a great extent. But, um, but I also learned how to communicate effectively. Um, I mean, even to the point where one day, one of the managers, when I was working, and this was many years ago, sent a memo to the other management managers and said uh, that he named me as being the most effective communicator on the entire staff of the entire radio station. And I felt pretty good about that because I, that took a lot of work on my part. Uh, but it's something we have to learn to do. And sometimes, yeah, sometimes we have to blow our own horn a little bit, modestly, just to let people know what we're doing. But um, we also have to 
communicate to them. Um, one of the things that I mentioned, I think a week or two ago was write instructions that they can understand and use on how to do things. Um, little things that you say, well, I don't have the time to do this. No, the correct answer is you don't have the time not to do it. It kind of it reminds me of a Dilbert cartoon. I brought it up here, but uh, there are a few years ago where the pointy hair boss tells Dilbert, go to human resources for a psychological evaluation. And Dilbert says, why? Have I said anything that's abnormal? And the boss says, you're an engineer. Everything you say is abnormal. That's the guy with the, the hair sticking up in the air, like yeah. the two horns. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where kind of, kind of like what Gordon says, we need to be able to, and, and we really do, we need to be able to communicate um, we need, we need to be able, we need to translate because we do speak somewhat of a different uh, language. So we need to be able to effectively translate and do it in a way that doesn't make anybody feel stupid because they're not stupid. They just don't know. Just like, I don't know how to sell. And if you're going to teach me to sell, you're going to have to really, <laughs> you're going to have to really teach me, but, uh, or a lot of things. I mean, you know, I don't. <laughs> I don't know how to perform brain surgery, so don't try to simplify it for me. <laughs> as long as we're talking about uh, Dilbert, there's the other character in there, isn't there? Mor Mordock, the uh, IP guy, information prevention. And all too often, it seems like IT really is IP. And the question really that we've been sort of edging toward for the last half hour is if you understand that this is the problem, what do you do? How do you get those departments together? I think having the conversation oh. up to management and management back down again, that engineering requires the support of a number of departments within the station or the production facility or whatever. And IT is one of them. I have a way to get them together. It's real easy. It's called pizza and beer. <laughs> food always works. Yeah. yeah food's, <laughs> food's the center of our universe. <laughs> well, one of the problems that I'm seeing that I've been listening for the last hour, and this industry is so large. There are so many stations and there are major markets, and there are medium markets, and there are small markets. And what works for one level, what one kind of stations, just doesn't work for something else. You know, and, and it's foreign to other places. You might be in a major market where spots do cut, where time does cost ten or twenty thousand dollars a minute. Uh, or you might be in a small market where you're lucky to get 50 bucks if you're having a good day. You know, I personally take care of one cluster with nine different radio stations between the stations and the translators that they use as additional brands, as I call them. And so what works for me might not necessarily work for a guy in Los Angeles or a guy in Cleveland or a guy in Natchez, Mississippi, you know, because it's so different for so many stations uh, because of the what's involved. Well, if you want to see absolute panic, uh, take a look at WR being off the air. Everybody went into um, master control. Oh, if you, um, in stations like that, if you're off the air for 10 seconds, somebody's going to get fired. Well, I... Well, you, you know, it wasn't any person's fault. Uh, you know, it was just in one case, we had uh, somebody come in. They were doing some work in the building and uh, took a look at the master telephone cable and decided there was a lot of money to be made in the copper. So they chopped the cable straight at the floor and the ceiling. Uh, we didn't lose the STL, but we lost all telephones. The network 
lost uh, feed because we were feeding ABC. Uh, so we ended up having to put the programming on uh, for the network on a CD and literally schlep it up to ABC on West End Avenue and uh, go from there. But, uh, you know, that was the worst thing that ever happened. Fortunately, we had um, an auxiliary transmitter, but we're rarely ever off the air for any length of time. But, you know, that's, there's a lot of money to be lost. And that's where the zeros come in. No ones in that one. How does that story end with the um, person wanting the copper? Uh, actually, uh, they discovered that there was so little copper in it that most of it was insulation that uh, somebody went into the basement and found they had just dropped it there. Building a uh, station in Morro Bay, California and had rolls of uh, copper uh, ground wire out in the field. And uh, somebody drove their uh, station wagon out there, cut up the rolls, put it in the back of the station wagon, and then was trying to drive out. But the weight made their uh, car sink into the mud. So the sheriff came by and uh, arrested them. And uh, apparently one of the people then faked a heart attack and uh, escaped that way uh, from, uh, from the hospital. So anyway, stealing copper is uh, another story. That goes to a whole series of discussion of security, physical security at sites. Yeah, on the list recently was something about a um, burglary during the day into uh, a transmitter building. It'd be interesting. This again is uh, maybe subject for another call, but what sorts of uh, alarm systems, uh, especially since people have a remote control, um, you know, door opening, um, cameras, et cetera. What do people have? Doesn't seem like this should be happening uh, without warning. It's often a cost thing, isn't it? That to install a security perimeter and cameras and internet connection is not something that the ownership wants to do. So you're fighting, you're fighting in both directions uh, as, as a, a broadcast uh, engineer tech. You're fighting for your money, for your budget from ownership and management. You're fighting IT to bring them on to a team, hoping that uh, you'll get that. Again, I think it just boils down to communication and finding a way to keep those, uh, those channels open. Um, I, uh, I, I, I'm a professional communicator. I've been writing my entire career. And uh, one of my, I, I consider one of my sworn duties is to make all of you look good in the media. And uh, I, uh, I speak just enough engineer to be dangerous, but uh, I also do a little bit of uh, translating for managers, which I think they, they do need to have the translation done for them. A lot of times they simply don't understand what it is that you're talking about. I, one thing I found big help in communicating is finding someone who can, shall we say, proofread, but not exactly proofread what you write. Um, we had a receptionist who was by her own admission a left-handed klutz who knew nothing about technology. And everything that I wrote before I sent it out, I gave it to her and let her read it. She says, I'm not quite sure what you're talking about, but it all makes sense. I knew I had hit it right then. <laughs> and uh, she was good. I mean, uh, she, she let, kept me from making really stupid mistakes in stuff that I wrote. And that included memos and as well as magazine articles and stuff like that. 
Uh, I miss her a lot. <laughs> well, most of the engineers I know can't spell worth a darn. And uh, so it's always a good idea to have somebody check it, or at least anyway, these days, run it through a spell checker. Yeah, they, they will quite often uh, change something, though, to what you don't want. Well, that's but, uh, true. You know, just like your predictive text on your phone. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's terrible. And There's uh, My wife also had the, a job where she was writing, and she always gave me, said I was her best proofreader for spelling, because I catch real, I'm particular about my spelling. Yeah, same here. There's also something in, in writing about knowing your audience because it's not an interactive medium. Somebody can't come back and say, what do you mean by this? Whereas in speaking, uh, it is interactive and, and uh, you can do that. But, but writing, got to know the audience. Agreed. Yep. Well, I wanted to um, elaborate on the doohickey that I said was uh, responsible for a lot of stuff. It's also known as a flash drive. <laughs> there, there are some flash drives, uh, I guess now, where they've got uh, different firmware in there. And um, so even if the flash area is okay, um, it will act like a key, uh, key logger or uh, even just do things on its own that's uh, buried in the firmware instead of the uh, flash memory. I have not seen one of those, but I did uh, read about it. Um, and getting back to being really primitive, it's very easy to take a flash drive and I put a hidden partition in. Yeah, actually, I think most of the uh, problems uh, of malware getting in comes from uh, either a flash drive or somebody, you know, clicking on a link that's malware. So that's got to be stopped, prevented. Yeah, the US Navy, in the U.S. Navy, we are not even allowed to use, to use USB drives on the uh, Navy owned uh, Navy owned computers anymore. And I think that's Department of Defense wide actually. They've, they've also had the issue of people stealing secrets uh, with USB drives. So <laughs> besides malware introduction. I was in the uh, main office of uh, what, well, it was sort of the home station for one of the groups and discovered that uh, every uh, USB port was disabled or filled with uh, super glue to prevent anyone from putting a flash drive into a computer. Turns out this was the result of a flash drive with all the financial data of the corporation being found on the street in Chicago. So, yeah. Ransomware, hacks, malware, flash drives being left around. There is definitely a reason for security. There's definitely a reason for IT people to be careful and watch over the rest of us. But we still have to communicate. Yeah, well, this, the this brings us full circle again. Yep. We were talking earlier about uh, IT people not letting us get on their network or not letting us get through and here we are talking about all the things we have to do to protect ourselves from things that can get on the network it's a it's a vicious circle is what it is and I, you know i i don't have an answer and i don't know that anybody here has an answer other than you know just working together and understanding each other's needs george's answer was the best i thought I still think that that um, the IT department is what a supplier to the engineering department and it, and the engineering is a customer and it's IT's job to help solve the problem. If you need to get audio from here to there, uh, they have to figure out a way to do it securely. They're supposed to be helping you. 
Well, in, the right too. in the days of big iron, before computers, we didn't have to worry about that. No malware in your teletype? <laughs> no. So should we all go back to cart machines and turntables? We well, as somebody who spent a lot of time on the air, yeah. That oh, was you want to sleep at night. I do miss the days of cleaning tape heads. Well, I actually had, I won't tell you where, but I had a chief engineer who um, threw all my Christmas cartridges away because the tape was too abrasive for the heads. So I had to go into a Christmas season uh, with no music. What kind of tape were you using? You know, I have no idea. It predated me at the station. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the heads were more important than the programming. Rich, that's my Christmas wish. Well, today, you know, the lack of Christmas music is a, is a real benefit for me. <laughs> You're here. One of my clients has already started Christmas. I can't believe they started two weeks before Thanksgiving. Unbelievable. Well, actually, we have a station uh, in Central Mass, actually the Worcester market, that's been doing it now for uh, about six weeks. Home Depot has had Christmas stuff on sale since September. Yeah, the last time I was in there playing Christmas music. I didn't stay there long. But strangely, uh, it provides a, a real bump in ratings. Doesn't last long, but uh, ratings go through the roof. Well, anyone else uh, that has not had a chance to share their thought uh, about what we do, what we shouldn't be doing, how we can make that peace with the IT folks. It is so necessary to have a successful operation. You know, there's been a lot of good comments today about education. And I think that's a lot of it. I, I look at this topic and kind of have an analogy with where I sit as a salesperson, because I deal with this daily between manufacturers, customers, and bridging the gap between the two. And, and it, it all comes down to relationships. It truly does. It comes down to building that rapport and relationship with those departments. I, I think that Mary is very correct on this. It's not that there's a disconnect here. There's disconnects in the entire industry. There's a disconnect between news and sales and uh, traffic is always irritating master control. There's, there's, there's always a back and forth and a give and take and it's kind of like lands in the station manager's desk to be able to smooth the relationships between each of the departments and then make sure that um, it continues that way and that when there's a problem, it's the general manager ultimately who's going to be responsible for the impact of that problem on the bottom line. So. It's in their best interest, his or her best interest to make sure that all of these divisions get smoothed over because it's not just between 
us and IT or IT and anybody else. Um, it's it's there in every every department. Yes, that's true. That's true. It's it's the need for we go back to education. How can we do that uh, as an industry, as a profession, and overcome the the walls? Well, I go back to my Harris days when we had luncheons, and I think a lot's accomplished in a luncheon outside of the office. It's a good point. Well, at uh, WOR, we had uh, weekly uh, managers meetings uh, where the heads of all departments met uh, and just shared stuff. I guess the key word there is shared. Sometimes this simply becomes a complaint session of all the things that one department doesn't like about another department. Well, that's strange because we didn't have that. Um, everybody uh, pretty much cooperated. It was a really a wonderful group of people. Uh, Everything I no I've idea. heard about the Buckleys is that they, they wanted an environment like that. Well, uh, yeah, the Buckleys thought of their employees as family, which so made it a wonderful place to work. Um, and the fact that Rick Buckley started as an NBC page, uh, you know, and just was really engrossed in, in broadcasting. So he was a, you know, a real broadcast owner and, uh, you know, just a, a great company to uh, to work for, and Rick in particular. I think you said the key word there, family, or a team, and less. There's less and less of that in the industry. Well, that was uh, that was Rick Buckley to start, and the GM Bob Bruno uh, was a real people person. And he treated everybody as if you were part of his immediate family. Just as a terrific guy. That, that's the point. It's, it's a corporate culture. It's an attitude that starts at the top and filters down to the employees. So if you have that, that corporate culture from the beginning, then you don't, you don't get a lot of, the kind of uh, inner inner departmental rivalries and annoyances and stuff because they don't tolerate it at the top. Well, at once at least once a year, um, Rick would take all of his managers of all stations, um, not general managers, but just department managers, and we would go somewhere. One year, uh, he flew us all out to Carmel, uh, California. Uh, we would go to Atlantic City and spend, um, you know, three or four days with the entire company. So, you know, each station had a different format and we all did, uh, you know, we all just, you know, shared stuff and uh, they paid for it. But the question is, how do you foster that? I worked for a station where in December one year, I got a bonus check, $10 with the taxes taken out. Okay, well, you rich folks are all alike. <laughs> I think it, as has been pointed out here, it is a uh, general management or ownership uh, situation um, and the, the culture that is created. In um, my last uh, job uh, as director of engineering of a manufacturing company and every Monday morning, uh, all the, the dozen engineers got together, as, you know, status for projects. We also had uh, people from production there reporting issues that, you know, needed to be addressed. And um, then the, the whole company would uh, get together once a month for something or another. 
So uh, it, it all really does come from the top down, I think. Really glad to have had everybody here today and enjoyed it. I hope everyone enjoyed it and look forward to next week and we'll have opportunity for chatting as well.